I want you to look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Today we're going to talk about divine connections and supernatural turnaround. Divine connections and supernatural turnaround. Right here in Luke 17, 32, you find the second shortest verse in the Bible. Who can tell me the, the shortest verse? Jesus wept. Jesus wept, right? Well, this is the second shortest. Remember Lot's wife. So today I'm going to start with this very short, but yet a very powerful scripture, a very powerful statement that Jesus made. While discussing, if you go back and read the chapter and read the context, while discussing uh, future things and being prepared for them, Jesus puts them in remembrance of Lot's wife, uh, something that had happened in Israel's past. You know, one of the purposes of history is to teach us lessons of life. Somebody once said, a man by the name of George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Jesus didn't want them to repeat what Lot's wife had done. Now, there's a time when you need to forget, but there's a time that you need to remember. And this particular case, Jesus is talking to them about the kingdom of God and all the things that's going to happen in the earth. And then all of a sudden, it's like a you know, mic drop mom moment when he just says, remember Lot's wife. I just feel like it, it, right then, you probably could have heard a pin drop in that place. Remember Lot's wife. I mean, just out of the blue, right out of nowhere. It seemed to have no connection with anything else that he has said. He said, remember Lot's wife. You know, there are people that they hold on to the past to the point that that history repeats itself. You've heard it said that history repeats itself, right? Well, I got news for you. You need to bring that on home. If you allow it to, your history will repeat itself. That's the reason it's known as cycles. Have you ever known, known, uh, noticed generational curses that run in families? Whether it might be divorce, alcoholism, cancer. It could be a, a list of a hundred different things or more, right? It's cycles. History repeating itself in a person and in their family, their children and their grandchildren, on and on and on, unless it stopped, right? Well, in Genesis 19, verse 17, I want us to go back there for a moment. Because when Jesus said, remember Lot's wife, you need, to rem you need to know what he was talking about. I'm not going to read it all, but I'll point out one verse in just a minute. Sodom and Gomorrah were very wicked. They were very wicked cities to the point that God even said, I hear the cry. The sin is so grievous, he said, I hear the cry coming up from the earth, and I'm going to go down and see if it's as bad as what it sounds like. And it was. So he sent two angels. Lot was living in Sodom with his wife and two daughters. And he sent two angels to bring them out. The place was so wicked, the men of the city tried to molest the angels. The angels had to blind them. And he said, I'm taking you out of this city. And what does the Bible say? It came to pass when they had brought them forth. He said, escape for your life. Look not behind you. Neither stay in the plain, escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. Don't but look back. Amen. He said, do not look back, escape for your life. And of course we know that God began to rain fire and brimstone. As soon as they walked out of that city, fire and brimstone began to rain from the sky to destroy them. And Lot's wife, the Bible says, 
In verse 26, his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. You know, it's one thing to have your primary residence in Zion, but want to keep your vacation spot in Babylon. This woman was looking back with longing, with desire. She, she had more confidence in what she had there than what God wanted to give her. There's a lot of people, they have no vision for their life whatsoever. They have a whole lot more confidence like she did in what's back there, what they already have, and they cannot see a brighter tomorrow. Her, her attachment to the past outweighed her confidence in the future. How many of you have confidence in your future right now? How many of you have already been praying and seeking the Lord and you've got something stirred on the inside of you that 2024 is going to be a year more? Now, I haven't heard anybody else say that because I haven't listened to any of the prophets. I gave up on most of those people that called themselves prophets a long time ago. I really did. Because after a man calls himself a prophet and he prophesies something that doesn't happen, I'm done. You hear me? I'm talking about especially something of major importance. Well, if they say I missed it, yeah, Brother Hagin himself said, I'm human, I can miss it. But if he did, he apologized for it. But I haven't listened to what everybody else is saying. Just in my spirit, here a couple weeks ago, just praying, looking to the future. It just kept coming up on this side of me. 2024 will be a year more. But it's for those who press in. Who, those who will believe for it. For those whom God will, they will allow God to give them a vision and they'll take hold of that vision and run with it. Isaiah 43 verse 18 says, Remember not the former things, and then in verse 19, he says, Behold, I will do a new thing. I challenge each and every one of you today, stop dwelling on the past, learn from it, but refuse to live in it. So many people dwell on the past. I have a, an uncle, and I love him dearly. And, but, you know, I saw him just last month when I went to visit my family. My brother called him and told him that I was going to be there, so he drove down, you know, an hour and a half or so to be with us one day. <clears throat> and I knew what was going to happen. I have never, I, I, I just don't know how in the world. He must get the books out of all the family trees, you know, and study every nut in that tree. And, I mean, it is unbelievable. So we're sitting at my mom, my sister's house, and he starts telling about who his mama, which is my grandma, about her grandma and her cousins and their husbands and wives and their children, and he starts naming them off one by one. I mean, I'm like, how, how can anybody be so stuck in the past that that's all they want to talk about? I, I'm sitting there, and uh so, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, how do I get off of this, get him off of this, you know? And I just turned to my sister, you know, and I said, how about let's get another cup of coffee? That coffee sure is good or something, you know? He stops talking long enough for us to have our little conversation, and he picks up right where he left off. He said, wait a minute, I got confused. Let me start over. And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> Some people, they're, they're so stuck in the past. Amen that they live in it. I don't, I'm telling you, that we should learn from our past. We should learn from our mistakes, but we should never live in the past. Amen. Amen. I want to go forward. Amen. I want to look ahead. Some of you that have been around here a while, you've heard me say that the reason that the windshield is bigger in the car than the rearview mirror because you ought to be spending more time looking ahead than behind you, right? See, the rearview mirror, all that does, it just reflects and shows you where you've been. You've already been there. Why keep looking at it? When there's something better, 
straight ahead of you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Faith is always pointed to the future. Faith always points to the future. You know what that tells me? That tells me that faith, didn't, uh, that, faith that Lot's wife did not have faith. She didn't have faith in what God had planned for her. She had no faith for a better tomorrow. When you study out the, the Hebrew word, when she looked back, she looked back longingly. She looked back with desire. She wanted to go back into that wicked place. And we all need to come to a point in our lives where we make up our mind, like the Apostle Paul, I'm going to do this thing, forgetting what's behind me and pressing for that which lies ahead of me. Pressing in. Because Paul understood that there's always, you know, uh, more and better, new horizons. God wants you to stretch your boundaries. Expand the boundaries of your life. I think about people in here, and there's a lot of them. They have businesses, some small, some, you know, pretty big, some medium size. Have you, in this economy, have you drew back and thought, well, you know, we just can't do anything more. We can't expand because of what's going on in the world today. I got news for y'all. Your God will make a difference in your life. He will make a difference in your business. He will make a difference in your family, your marriage, your children, your finances, your body, your mind, in every area of your life that you believe for him to do it. Amen. How many know he's keeping records? He really is. There's books in heaven. One of the prophets, when he was before the Lord, he saw the books that were opened. And, he, and this was before the book of life was ever brought out. He saw books. There's all kind of books in heaven. Matter of fact, I'm going to touch on one of those in just a moment. But see, Lot's why she doubted that God could give her something better than she already had. And what I want y'all to understand is that where you've been is not near as important to God as where you are right now and where you will allow him to take you. That's the reason he said to the prophet, he said, don't remember the former things. Behold, I will do a new thing. I want to do something new in your life. I want to do something bigger. I want to do something better in your life. Don't limit God. Take the limits off what God is able to do. The Bible says in Psalm 78, 41, speaking of the people of Israel, they limited the Holy One of Israel. They put limits on him. When you walk in this church, for example, does it make any difference whether it's a Sunday morning or Wednesday night? We could be having revivals and it could be a, a, a weeknight. When you walk in this church, I'm talking about as a congregation as a whole, it is up to you as a congregation, more than the speaker, it is more, more up to you as to how far the service can go. How high the anointing can rise. You realize... I, for example, the pastor, I can be all week long. I could be praying. I've had it happen, studying, excited. Man, I've got this message, and I'm so stirred up about it. And I, I mean, I'm just, oh, I can't hardly wait. And when I get up here in the pulpit and I stand up and I look, the anointing goes, Ooh. You know why? People aren't always pulling. People are always expecting. People aren't, aren't always wanting to hear what God has to say. A lot of times you've got people that they're bogged down with the busyness of life. And they, many of people are worried about something that's going on in their life. They haven't got their thoughts on the Lord. 
They're tired. They're sleepy. And when you, when you have a congregation as a whole that's that way, it limits what God is able to say and do. Amen? Now, we don't have that happen around here very often, thank God. Nothing like it used to be a long time ago. But here's the thing. God wants you to know that he will do as much in your life as you will allow him to. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. I'm just hitting the high points, okay? Hebrews 9, 11 tells us that Christ came as a high priest of good things to come. Everybody say good things to come. Now, those two words to come are translated from the Greek word M-E-L-L-O, mellow, which means to intend, to have in mind, to about to be. He is the high priest. Jesus Christ is our high priest of good things to come. And I'm telling you right now, there are more good things that he wants to come into our lives, into our church. But it's up to us. He wants to do something good. He wants to do something new in your life. Looking back over the last year, I realized that there's been a, a lot of challenges for many people here in the church. Some people have faced, you know, certain types of sicknesses and diseases. They've lost loved ones. They've experienced financial problems, marriage problems, all kind of family problems. And as I was praying, God revealed to me how that Divine connections have made such a major difference in my life. As a matter of fact, if I was to share them all, we'd be here all day long. And I'm not going to share them all, but I'm going to share a few things with you because God wants you to know that if you will be led by the Holy Spirit, he will help you to be in the right place at the right time, to meet the right people, God will bring it about through divine connections. And he was revealing this to me, that divine connections throughout my life have meant many times, in many cases, supernatural turnarounds, supernatural things to happen. Not only sometimes these divine connections have thrust me into new territory and new uh, opportunities, but they've, they've opened doors to go places, to do things that would have never happened if it had not been for divine connections. I want you all to release your faith. I encourage you, release your faith for divine connections. Okay? Amen. I'm going to share a few things with you. Now, you've heard me talk about my divine connection with Reverend Kenneth e. Hagen, that I will refer to as Dad Hagen. But it goes back even further than that. But first of all, look with me in Psalms 139, verse 16. Now, in the King James, it says in thy book, <clears throat> all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I want y'all to listen to it in the Amplified Classic. In your book, all the days of my life were written before ever they took shape, when as yet there was none of them. Imagine a book somewhere in heaven with your name on it. God planned out every day of your life. Now, there are people who live and die and never experience one single day out of that book. You say, how is that possible? Because you don't get started on that path until you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And even then, it is possible to live doing things your way instead of God's way. Instead of being led by the Spirit, you do things according to the way you think is best. But when a person begins to seek the Lord with all their heart, 
when they pray, when they spend time with God, they spend time in his word, they're worshiping him. They have a heart's desire to please the Lord more than anything else. I just think it was amazing that Billy Graham's wife once said, right after, he said she said, uh, I never knew anyone in my life. Now think about that. They went all over the world. They met thousands of people all, all over the world. She said, I never met anyone in my life that wanted to please the Lord as much as Billy. That should be our, every one of our heart's desire. I want to please God. When you get to that point, you wake up in the morning, and all of a sudden, there's an unction. There's a leading. There's a desire. I need to do this. I need to read this. I need to eat breakfast at that place this morning instead of going to one I used to go to. Why? Because God's got somebody waiting for you. I remember, <clears throat> now I'm telling you folks, I'm, I'm truly convinced that apart from divine connections, I would not be here today. We would not be pastors here. And without this connection, we'll never live the life that God designed us to live. When I was a senior in high school, 1973, I walked in to English class three for the second time. Did y'all catch that? I was a senior. The only class that I ever failed. And the real, only reason I failed it is because I wouldn't show up for class and I wouldn't do any work. Because it was hard. And my dad made us work. And so I refused to study. Well, it just so happened when I walked in that day I looked around, there was not a desk available. And the teacher says, just go stand at the back of the room until we can sort things out and get everybody a desk. So I did. It just so happened that there was a uh, red-headed girl standing back there too, right beside me. And we hit it off from that day, and long story short, she became a girlfriend. There was a connection there that God wanted to happen. You know why? Because it wasn't long before her mother said, tell Eddie, unless he comes to church. See, I wouldn't go to church with her. They went every time. They were, they were just like Pastor Alley's family. They, was, they went every time the doors were open. But I wouldn't go to church. So her mother said, you tell Eddie that if he wants to continue to see you, that he's going to have to come to church with you. So she told me, and I said, okay. And I got born again. Amen? Amen? Now, 1975, I'm working at a Delco Remy battery plant. I happened to go to the break room, and on my way back, I walked by a, a, a different department that I did not work in, and uh, a man came out of that department over to the hallway there, and he must have seen earlier that I had a New Testament in my pocket, and so he stepped out of it and met me. I had no idea who he was. And he just kind of reached out and tapped my Bible. And he said, I know the author of that book right there. And I said, well, praise the Lord. Long story short, divine connection. He invited me to a full gospel bidding men fellowship international meeting in Tifton, Georgia, where for the first time I heard teaching on the word of faith. I heard people talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the healing power of God and miracles. These are divine connections that happen in my life. Well, later that same year, I've told y'all about the divine connection when I was praying and asking the Lord, send somebody into my life that can teach me, that has walked this spirit-filled life, that knows how to live by faith. And he spoke, spoke to me and said, hook your TV to the uh, antenna to the back of your stereo. I did, and there, first time I heard Kenneth E. Hagin. God connected me with him supernaturally. And what I want y'all to see is the progression. Oh, and I'm skipping all kinds of things. I don't have time to go through all of them. 
But I want you to notice the progression of how through these connections, the revelation that came to me. Jesus had told Brother Hagin, go and teach my people faith. That's how I learned faith. He connected me with a man who taught faith like nobody else. A lot of you don't even know this, but back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was a group of healing ministers, an association, actually, people like Rex Humbard and Oral Roberts and, uh, oh gosh, so many, Catherine Kuhlman. There was about six of them that was a part of this. They went all over the country. They had their tents holding healing miracle meetings. Brother Hagin was a young man at the time, and one day in a special meeting of the ministers, I don't know how the subject came up, but they began to talk about certain ones of them that were sick, the preachers. These people had an anointing to pray for others and have great miracles, but many of them were dying of sickness and disease themselves. Brother Hagen got up in the meeting and said, I'm going to tell you all right now, I'll be here when the rest of y'all are gone. And they wanted to know why. He said, because I know how to live by faith. You say, you mean to tell me they could get people healed and they didn't know how to live by faith? Exactly. It's one thing to understand the anointing and how the anointing works. It is a total different thing to know how to walk by faith. I'll tell you this much as well. Anything you receive by the anointing, if you don't learn to keep it by faith, you will lose it. Because the devil will counterattack. And I've seen counterattacks kill people several times in the past. Well, let's see. We're going to pick up it here, all right? Somewhere in 1981, 82, this young woman sitting in front of me started attending my church. And as I was praying one night, God said, she will be your wife, divine connection, divine connection. Well, what y'all don't understand is before she came to the church, she had moved to Atlanta from South Georgia. She had moved to Atlanta, had no intention of ever coming back, but through a series of events, God brought her back. She got born again, got filled with the Holy Ghost, started coming to the church and bam, Hallelujah. You're talking about God turning things around and blessing us. In 1983, the Lord told us to move from where we were living in Rochelle, Georgia, to Fitzgerald, Georgia. I met a woman at a dentist office. This lady that came in, she was a young woman, she probably wasn't about 20, 21, something like that. And she come in to prep me, you know, before the dentist came in. It was my first time there in that particular office because we had moved to that town. Now we're seeking the will of God about where does he want us to go next? What do you want me to do next? See, a lot of people, they get bogged down. They get stuck. They do the same thing every day over and over and over and over and never even think to ask God, God, do you have something different in store for me? I resigned the church that I was at, moved to this town of Fitzgerald, Georgia, because God said to, with no idea why. Does that sound familiar? How about Abraham. Not even knowing where he was go going, he went. That's just walking by faith, people. And so, in that office that day, the young woman comes in and we're talking. And I just point blank ask her, are you saved? And she said, well, matter of fact, I am. I said, where do you go to church? She said, you ever heard of uh, Kenneth Hagin, Raymond Bible School? And I said, yeah, I have. Tell me about it. She said, well, my pastors started, came out of Florida, 
in the little town where I live at, next to Fitzgerald, she said, and uh, not long ago, they came here, started the church, that's where I go. And that's where we wound up for five and a half years before we went to Ramah ourselves. A divine connection. Hallelujah. Connected with that uh, couple, Pastor David and Betty, before we left to go. In 93, this is amazing. In 1993, now we moved here in 92. In 1993, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you all, Ralph, I don't even know it yet, but I'm going to have him to share some things about this church and how God raised this church up because he knows more about it than anybody. And uh, when, when we, the day that we have the ordination for him, I'm going to have him share some things. But I'm not going to share none of what he's going to be talking about. Um. That day I went to town. There used to be a Wachovia bank right on the main street in Kershaw. And I walked in that bank when I came out. There was a prophet and another man standing on the sidewalk. Right in the main downtown Kershaw. Met me at the, my car door. The guy who is a prophet was from Texas. He'd come to visit the guy who had been pastor here who had resigned. And I asked about, because I didn't know either one of them. I had never seen either one of them in my life. And so we met and began to talk and ask them about, you know, how did this happen? I wanted the details. And so the former pastor said, well, we were sitting in my house out in the country, and he said the prophet had come by to see me. And all of a sudden he got up and said, let's go to town. Let's go to Kershaw. He said, why do you want to go? He said, let's just go. He said, so we get to town, we get to the light, and he says, turn to the right. He said, I turn right. He said, go down to about halfway to block, park right there. And he said, so we park, and he said, let's get out and wait. And he said, and then when you walked out, the prophet said, see that man coming out of the bank with a little boy? My son was with me. And he said, yeah, he said, that's the man you need to meet right there. Because the group that had been left here without a pastor, Brother Ralph being one of the chief people, him and his family, were praying for God to send a pastor. And not just any pastor. They wanted somebody who's going to teach the word. They wanted the will of God for their lives. That was a divine connection. That's how we wound up here, folks. All night long, I think it was uh, pretty much most of the night before last and last night. I don't have these happen, these times happen very often. Usually when I lay, lie down, man, I sleep, boy, I sleep good. I mean, I do, I sleep good. But for a couple of nights, I have not really what you would call going into a deep sleep at all. My mind and my spirit kept seeing uh, Brother Gary, Brant's dad. And the Lord began to show me some things. Um, I don't know how many of you ever got to know him or not. But I thank God for the little time that we did get to know him and fellowship with him. But I'll never forget sitting back here at the fellowship meal when he joined the church, he told me about how that Miss Charlotte started watching some of the Word of Faith preachers on TV. What, what were they before that? Were they Baptist, Methodist, or what? A little bit all of it, huh? <laughs> and he said, so my wife, she's watching these people, you know, on Kenneth Copeland Network and all. And so he said, he said, I wasn't paying no attention to it. He said, but man, we were having all kinds of problems. And I got to thinking, Lord, you're talking about a supernatural turnaround. Now, Brent, you may have to help me a little bit here because I, my wife will tell you I get things mixed up sometimes in my stories. But if I'm not mistaken, he told me 
that things were so bad that particular Christmas, this before he got into the word of faith, he said things were so bad, we went through the house that year and picked out stuff we thought the kids and grandkids would like. Didn't have money to buy presents, and we wrapped them, you know, and gave them out. Hey, about that time, Miss Charlotte finally got him to sit down and start listening. And he said, and when I got the revelation along with her of the word of faith and how the word of faith works, he said, man, we begin to activate seed time and harvest, giving and receiving the law of confession. We begin to put it to work to the point if I'm not mistaken now, this is where I need your help. I think he said by the following Christ, Christmas and within one year's time, he had paid off how much debt? Do you remember? Over $100,000 or more? $250,000 debt. And not only that, was it his plane or another person's plane? Huh? It was his plane. We're talking about in one year, the next Christmas he flew in his plane full of presents to wherever all the family met, Atlanta or somewhere, in one year. You're talking about supernatural turnaround. You say, well, what's that got to do with divine connections? Well, hold on. I'm glad you asked. Because <laughs> I had the same question to the Lord. What's this got to do with the divine connections you're talking to me about? Y'all don't realize that what you do to now, to today, what you're doing right now, can only affect your life today, but it can affect your children's lives tomorrow, your grandchildren's lives 10, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Amen? I don't know if y'all had a chance to meet him when we had a tent revival. On Friday night, Brant had invited Brother Gary's and Sister Charlotte's former pastor uh, Pastor Bobby calls and his wife to come to revival. He was something he was believing God for, uh, a healing. And so they came, and I invited him to have a meal with us. And uh, I had met him one time before, and that was at Brother Gary's home-going go service. As a matter of fact, I remember when we were in the line, walking through, just waiting to speak to the family, there was a gentleman sitting on a, on a couch and as I walked by him, I told my wife, I said, that man's a pastor. Well, I told y'all, told Josh. I said, that man's a pastor. I knew him in spirit. He's a pastor. And sure enough, he's the one that got up and spoke. And then later on, they introduced me to him, and I talked to him myself. Uh, he was their pastor for, what, 25, 30 years, some of like that? Brother Bobby, back here, we just hit it off. It was a divine connection. He told me, he said, when Brother Gary first came to my church, he was wanting to start a business, and he had to go and borrow some money to start the business. He said, I was at the same time working with a pastor down in Costa Rica to get a church started there, and he said, so... Uh, Gary went with him, right? Or he gave the money for him to go. He paid for him to go out of the money he had borrowed to start the business. He had, he had three thousand dollars left, and he gave it all. He gave it all. Three thousand dollars left, and he gave it all to help Pastor Bobby go down to Costa Rica and get this church started. Today, there's three churches. When he asked me to go to Costa Rica with him. Folks, I don't normally do this. Most of the time, I will say, well, let me pray about it. I'll seek the Lord and find out what God wants me to do. I knew immediately God wanted me to go. I knew immediately that we were supposed to be a part of it. I want y'all to see that connection and how quickly things turn around, how God opens doors, how God brings new opportunities into people's lives. I wish there was words that I could, I could find to help you to really understand that you can live out every day of your life according to what's written in that book mentioned in Psalm 139. And I know we got young men 
like these two right here, right now, seeking God, others, some of your children, grandchildren, some of you personally are seeking the Lord for his perfect will in your life. And I want you to be able to walk by faith, no anxiety, no care, simply knowing and trusting that God has your future in store and he'll reveal it to you. He'll make it known to you if you'll just trust him. But you've got to listen to him. And he'll tell you some crazy stuff. <laughs> what seems crazy to this mind? Right. Amen? I have literally had the Lord tell me while riding down the road going somewhere, maybe stopping and thinking about having lunch, and God said, stop at that restaurant right there. And while in there, I meet the man who carried the pitcher of water. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Look with me in Luke 22, verse 8. See, it was through Brother Gary that God connected me with Pastor Bobby. And now I'm looking forward to connecting with people in Costa Rica. And he told me, he said, you know, they're good people, love the Lord. He said, but they need to be taught so much. And man, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. This mandate that God has given me to, to perfect what is lacking in people's faith, it burns in my heart. I so much want to see every one of God's children know how to walk by faith. He sent Peter and John saying, go prepare the Passover that we may eat, the Passover meal. And so they asked him, where? Where do you want us to go that we can prepare it? He said, listen, when you go enter to the city, There'll be a man that'll meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters. Say to the goodman of the owner of the house, the master says unto you, where is the guest chamber? Well, I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there, make ready. Arrangements already made. Divine arrangements, divine connections. Isn't it amazing? A lot of people will not step forward in faith to do something new, to do something they've never done before because they wonder, well, where am I going to get the money? Where am I going to get the help? How am I going to know what to do? That's like coming to a new place state a new town with your family and starting a church from scratch do y'all do understand that when you obey god god makes arrangements ahead of you when we called to tell the couple that we were coming to south carolina they said we knew it we're gonna let you live in our house until you find one of your own right so we're meeting in the house and then we go up to the Kershaw, to the bowling alley, and we meet there for several months. And I'm praying and I'm looking, and then the prophet shows up with the former pastor who introduces me to Ralph and Vernon. Here's the building. God's got everything already planned. God's got it planned, folks. Amen? Amen. He's got your future planned. Today, as we take communion, I'm going to ask the ushers to come to help me now. As we take communion, huh? does everybody have the elements? Raise your hand if you don't. Uh, ushers, if y'all would, look around and make sure those people got the hand up. Guys, make sure they got uh, the elements.
As everybody's getting ready, I want to challenge you to receive communion today with an understanding that you are a covenant child of God. You're not here to try to convince God to do something for you. As a child of God, you don't beg your father. God wants you to know that he loves you unconditionally. He so much wants to help you. He so much wants to bless you. He's got new things in store for you. But as you partake of this communion, especially the cup that represents the, the, the juice that represents the blood, I want you to realize I'm a child of God. I have a place in the family of God. Not only am I an heir of Almighty God, I'm a joint heir with the Lord Jesus Christ. What is his is mine. We share. Amen? God wants to direct my path. He wants me to know his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You know how I learned to hear the voice of God? I read that scripture and I started to say it. I would say it several times every day. I'm one of his sheep. I know the voice of God. You say, why? You mean you said that before you knew the voice of God? Yes, that's the only way you're ever going to get to know the voice of God. I'm led by the Holy Spirit. I'm a son of God. Therefore, I'm led by the Spirit of God. I know his voice. And when you do this, folks, listen to me. I want you to come to a place, a realization that every morning you get up, you can lift your hands and just you can say, Father, I thank you for this day. You created this day. I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm going to walk by faith today. I'm going to be led by your spirit today. I'm going to do exactly what you tell me to do. I trust you to help me in the right place at the right time to make divine connections. And folks, if you need some turnaround in your life, expect for it to be supernatural. Let me read this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In other words, remember me. When you do this, remember me. Remember what I did for you. Remember what I made possible for you. After the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the wafer. Let's eat together. Break it and eat it. Before we drink of the cup representing the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit just told me to say something. And I don't know who it's for, but probably for a lot of people. I know we could all apply it to our lives. Earlier, we talked about these things that we're to forget. There's something we are to remember in order to learn from them. But there's so much that we need to forget. It means to let go, to drop it. How many of you know when God forgave us our sins, the Bible says he removed them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. Right? One of the things I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to challenge us today, and this is just an example. It applies in other areas of life as well. How many of you know no one likes to have 
skeleton that's brought out of the closet. Married couples seem to me have more problems because every time they get mad, they say they have forgave one another for what happened last month, last year, five years, ten years. But every time they get mad, they're so quick to remind their spouse of what they did. I'm telling you right now, we ought to be like God. If we have forgave somebody, it should never be brought up again. It should never be brought up again. That applies to your parents, to your children, to everybody else. You forgive people. Amen? You release, you let go. That's what the blood is all about, folks. Amen? I want you to hold this and say it out loud. Say, Father God, I'm thankful for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken for my healing. This day, I decree, decree healing in my body, healing in my family. I believe no weapon formed against me or my family will prosper. I condemn everything that rises against me in the name of Jesus. No plague will come down my dwelling. I thank you, Father God, that you make a difference in my life. I praise you for the blood of Jesus that washed away my sins. You have forgiven me. You remember them no more. And I ask you, Father, to help me to walk in that same level of love. That when I have forgiven someone, that I will never bring it up again. I release it. I let it go. And not only that, Lord, I can remember what was done to me, but it has no power over me. It has no pain, no hurt, no anger, no shame associated with it anymore. I'm free. I thank you now for the blood of Jesus. And as I partake of this cup, I am reminded that I am your covenant child. Led by your spirit, listening and obeying your voice. And I believe that starting right now, I will be at the right place at the right time. I'll follow the man with the picture. I thank you, Father God, for divine connections, for divine arrangements. I choose to live by faith. Never again will I be afraid to take a step into the future regardless of how unknown or how full of fear it looks, I will not be moved except by your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. We praise you, Lord. I want you to just bow your head for a moment. For those that are here, for those that are watching online as well, maybe God has spoken to you during this service concerning things in the past that you need to leave here today. You need to leave them under the blood of Jesus. You need to forget them in order to move on. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down here. I'm going to pray for you, though. I see those hands. Are there things happening in your family this past year that you say, Father God, I need your help, and I want deliverance from it, and I want healing for it? Raise your hand if that's you. Anything going on in your body, your mind, your finances, you say no more. I want what God has in store for me. Raise your hand. Father God, you've seen. Most of the congregation has raised their hands, and I just speak blessings upon them. You have placed me here, Lord. The Holy Ghost has made me the overseer of one of your flocks. And my heart's desire, Lord, my wife and I, Lord, as spiritual parents, we so desire to see our children walk in the truth of your word and to walk in your blessings. So I thank you, Father God, that starting right now, that there's going to become change 
in their hearts, in their lives, their families, and in every, every area of their lives. I believe for it, Lord. And I thank you that the anointing is working, destroying yokes. And because we choose to walk by faith, we choose to obey you, Father God. You make a difference in our lives so that our families, our friends, and the world will recognize and know that we are sons and daughters of the only true and living God. In Jesus' name, amen.